Hey there, welcome to the Healthy Vibes Podcast. I'm Kelly Renato, and I'm so excited that you're here with me today. I have a great conversation with Angela Chapman today, who is a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, which means she takes a holistic approach to wellness. She currently is working with Alzheimer's patients or anyone that's having or experiencing any cognitive decline, and she gets to the root cause through lab testing and getting to know your background as to what is causing it. Not just masking symptoms or waiting to see what happens, but she has had enormous success with her clients. It's an eye-opening conversation, and I hope you stay till the very end. Here we go. All right. Welcome, Angela, to my podcast, and I I so appreciate you being here today. Thank you for giving us your time. Well, thank you for asking me. I really appreciate being on. Well, I feel like I've been getting your emails um, on Sundays, and you're so good at that um, for a, a while, and you just provide so much good information. And I just, one day it hit me, I was like, I have got to share Angela and all of her information with more people because, um, there's just a lot people I think can learn from you and and not realizing simple choices they can make. Um, and so many people are being are faced with what you provide. Like they have someone in their life with Alzheimer's and and not sure what their next step is. So I first just I want you to give us a little bit of background on yourself and your training and um, your expertise, if you don't mind. Sure. Well. Um... When it comes to the health aspect of my background, um, I'm a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, and that is a little bit like being a health detective. And so it's not just nutrition, but it is utilizing functional lab testing to help people uncover the hidden causes of their health issues, if they have them, or proactively to discover them before they have symptoms, and then taking a very holistic um, strategy to either bring them back to health or to prevent um, disease from happening. And as I was going along that path, I actually have a long family history of Alzheimer's myself. Um, my great grandmother, my grandmother, my aunt, my mom, most recently, my 64 year old cousin all passed Mm. away with Alzheimer's. And so in that line, I'm next, um, but I'm not going to be next, (laughs) but, um, um, but you would think that that would be the thing that would have gotten me interested in this path related to Alzheimer's. But actually the thing that really pushed me, um, was the diagnosis of a 50 year old friend of mine who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Yeah, at 50. And I started doing some research and I came across uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen's research. And um, the study that I read, nine of 10 of the people in his case study had reversed their Alzheimer's. And yeah, he he had my attention. And um, I found out he was training practitioners. And so that was 2016. And I went to that training. And as I sat there, I realized that Everything I've done up until this point actually prepared me for this. And, you know, so, so I just, I, I changed the direction of everything that I was doing in, in my practice to focus on Alzheimer's disease and primarily prevention of Alzheimer's disease, um, either before you have symptoms or when you just start to notice those, those early symptoms and you might be blaming them on senior moments. Um, or people who have uh, mild cognitive impairment already have a diagnosis. And uh, I do have clients who already have Alzheimer's, um, but I'm very interested in getting on the front end of that because there's so much you can do to prevent it. That's super interesting and exciting because I I do believe um, I have certain, I shouldn't say several, but so... I'm at that point where my parents, you know, and they're older, um, my mom who's still with us. And I have friends whose parents are starting to have more of those moments. And I've had conversations with my friends, like, and they've met with people, doctors, but you feel like 
you, you, there's nothing else you really can do. Like you just try to um, support them through it, I guess. And it sounds like maybe you're saying there are some things that could help still. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you work with all eight, like you just said the different, so do you have people that are several years into Alzheimer's too? I do. I do. Yeah. I, um, I have people really at all stages and in various ages, um, you know, anywhere from people in their forties and fifties who are most interested in prevention, people who have an early diagnosis of Alzheimer's, um, 61 years old would be probably the youngest, I think, or maybe 58 is the youngest. Um, and then people who've had a recent diagnosis of Alzheimer's. But the interesting thing about it is, is that a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, you know, you're not at the beginning of it at that point. And that's why I really try to drive home the fact that you've got to start preventing this before you have a diagnosis. You can't prevent what you've already got, right? Um, right. But Alzheimer's is really sneaky because it starts long before you have symptoms, decades before you ever have symptoms. And there's so much you can do. I mean, and, and it's, it's, it's basic healthy living for the most part, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's not that different from um, anything that you're going to already naturally be doing to try to live a healthy lifestyle. I mean, exercise is one of the very best things that you can do to which prevent is, Alzheimer's. Which is all good news. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All good news that it's hopefully things that we're already trying to do. Um, so what are, can you give some early signs? Um, when you say the, long before you actually see symptoms, are there, is yeah. besides testing, are there ways, you know, or. Well, when you don't have symptoms, there's not, there's not like a way you can know. So let's talk about someone who has a family history of Alzheimer's, especially maternal family history of Alzheimer's. Like I do, um, mm -hmm. There are some early changes that, that we know happen um, before you have symptoms. And if you did have these, these specific tests, you would see the beginnings of these things starting to happen. One of those is um, brain hypometabolism. It just means your brain isn't really able to use glucose for energy efficiently. And that's what it primarily wants to use. You don't have any symptoms of this in the beginning. It'll take you know, 10, 20 years to ever really have symptoms from it. But for me, I just go ahead and place myself firmly in that pre-symptomatic category and act accordingly. I don't feel like I need to go get an MRI. I've got the family history. And, gotcha. um, and it's easy enough to just adjust, in this case, my diet um, to kind of work around that in a way. You can give your brain mm -hmm. energy from ketones instead of from glucose. And once you have symptoms, that's always a, a good thing to try to start trying to improve them. But, um, but on the pre-symptomatic side, you know, just lowering those sugars, making sure that you're getting plenty of um, fiber, good nutrition um, without the added sugars, um, whether you're eating them or drinking them. Gotcha. So sugar is a big one then. Yeah, sugar, starchy carbs, those things that metabolize in the body real fast to sugar. Gotcha. Exercise and then any other um, lifestyle changes you would say that you could I would say you today? definitely need to optimize your sleep. Sleep. Sleep is a big one because while you sleep, there are some really important things going on in your brain. Um, one of those is, is um, your brain clears out debris during deep sleep. And you could consider amyloid plaque debris. And that's one of the hallmark characteristics of Alzheimer's. And so your body's kind of set up to, um, to prevent Alzheimer's as it is. I mean, it has a lot of processes that it goes through. But if you're not getting enough sleep, then you're missing out on some of that natural prevention. And, um, and so seven to eight hours of really good restful sleep very, very important. Very important. I always love when it goes back to the fact that our body really can heal itself and it's there to help us if we allow it. 
and we take good care of it. It is. It's set up to work. I mean, your body's supposed to work. And, and it will. Just give it what it needs. And then, you know, when it gets out of balance, figure out, okay, wait a minute, what's caused that? And, and then start working to, to fix that, and you can bring it back into balance. Which is interesting because one of the things in one of your emails, you, you said something to the effect of um, if following your doctor's orders is not always the best path or something to that effect. Um, and you know, with what you just said about when it gets out of balance and figuring out what it is, can you explain a little bit what you meant by that? Sure. When, um, generally when people go to the doctor because they're having cognitive problems, by the time, by the time it's, it's affecting them enough to schedule a doctor's visit, you know, they're, they're really having some pretty serious symptoms and they'll get a diagnosis usually of mild cognitive impairment which uh, is just one step below Alzheimer's. And while everyone who, who has mild cognitive impairment doesn't go on to develop Alzheimer's, about 5 to 10% of people do each year. That's not total people. That's each year, that many people. Mm-hmm. Um, and generally what the doctor is going to tell you at that point is we just have to wait and see if it gets worse. You know, They sometimes prescribe an Alzheimer's medication, um, if they do give you an Alzheimer's diagnosis, they will prescribe one of those uh, the approved Alzheimer's medications. Generally, they'll approve something like Aricept. And we know those medications don't work. And they do have side effects. And, you know, that's really all they have to give you. And so rather than take a medication that doesn't work and wait for things to get worse... You can go the other way (laughs) and do all of the things that can make a big difference. And the main thing that you would want to start out doing at that point is figure out what's causing it, because that's really the foundation of the the protocol that I use is finding out what's causing your symptoms. And we can find that out with a number of lab tests. And then once we get a full picture of what's really going on, then we can use that information to start optimizing each thing to bring the body back into balance and to improve the cognition. Um, And again, the earlier you start, the much better chance there is of, you know, really reversing those symptoms. So when you say when you do those lab tests and you can figure out what's causing it, can you give an example maybe of things that could be causing it that maybe you find that ha- there's a better avenue than what sure. they're telling you to do? Yeah, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, one of my clients was 61 years old when when I first met, met he and his wife, and he had a diagnosis of early onset Alzheimer's. The neurologist had just told him that he had about three years before he would be non-functional and he needed to get his affairs in order. Oh, my goodness. She had done no testing. She had done given him a MOCA, which is a standard um, verbal type of a test that is usually um, done, you know, right there in the office to give doctors an idea of where you might fall cognitively on that scale. And that was it. That's all she'd done. He'd scored pretty low on it. And so he and his wife, um, you know, they got back in the car and they were like, oh, this can't be, you know. And so she started searching for solutions. She came across Dr. Bredesen's research, and then she read his book, and then she started looking for somebody to help her implement this and uh, the protocol, and so she she found me that way. And I started doing his lab testing, and a lot of things looked really good. I'm like, this has to be toxic. He's young. He doesn't have a family history of Alzheimer's. His first symptoms were uh, reading comprehension, which was a real problem because he was a pastor. And, uh, and so we started testing for some various types of toxins, and it turned out that he had had a lot of exposure to mycotoxins from mold, both in his home and in his office, and, and had no idea. You know, it wasn't visible in the house, and his wife was fine, and they, were, they just had no idea that that was going on. But that turned out to be, I would say, the major contributor to his cognitive decline. And it's been seven years, and he's still doing really well. 
Oh, wow, that's wonderful. Yeah, he's not all the way back. Um, he still has some cognitive impairment, but he's living a normal life. And um, and so that's, you know, <laughs> far better than the, the three amazing. years that his doctor gave him when she put him on that Dinepazil. Um, Absolutely. So what do you, what did you do or what did he do for the mold? Like what, what was, the, you know, his next steps? The next steps generally with, with mycotoxin exposure, once you kind of nail it down, you first need to get him out of that exposure. He's got to get away from it because as long as you're being exposed, it's going to continue to be a problem. And they did a lot of remediation on their home. They ultimately did end up moving um, because they just couldn't get it under control. And, and it, was, it was very complicated. It was actually much easier for them to move. Um, and then also some detoxification for him, um, as well as just general health building strategies with diet and rest and exercise and sleep. He was already an exerciser, an avid exerciser, actually. Um, one of those people who you wouldn't have expected to ever have that diagnosis. Right. But it was this toxic form of Alzheimer's. And um, that, that actually is the form of Alzheimer's I told you about. Um, my 50 year old friend, that's what she had as well. Wow. So what, what, when you say detoxification, like besides moving, was there other ways to cleanse his body? There is. There are some specific protocols that we use with different types of products that work naturally with the body's detoxification system. Um, and also, you know, he was doing a lot of sauna, infrared sauna, um, sweating is always good. Okay. Um, but the, uh, you know, the different types of products and binders and things like that, that you use to actually, you know, push and catch toxins to get them out of the body. So interesting. Very interesting. Well, that's wonderful to hear that he's still doing so well. Um, and that's just, you said back with the doctors prescribing the medicine and you said we know they don't work is that where research studies are showing that that they don't work but they still prescribe them is that what absolutely you mean? absolutely oh it's the gosh. only thing that they have to prescribe right. and you know the doctor's job is to diagnose and prescribe right, right. and so right. but that's all they have and and the pharmaceutical companies have been trying for i don't know 30 years to find something that will clear amyloid from the brain in the hopes that that will improve the cognition. The problem is it's never worked ever. And even the things that have been approved most recently don't actually improve the cognition. They slow it by a certain percentage, but they don't actually improve the cognition. And that's because they're looking for that one drug, that magic bullet that's going to make the difference. But Alzheimer's is much more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. And so instead of trying to clear amyloid from the brain, you've got to ask the question, what's causing that? So what's causing the amyloid in the brain? Like what's something causing that? caused yeah. it. And there are many, many causes. There are a lot of underlying contributors to Alzheimer's. You know, this toxic type, it could be infections. It could be um, toxins like mycotoxins. It could be something like Lyme disease. Um, but then there are several other subtypes of Alzheimer's according to what's causing those symptoms, you know? And one of those um, that's really common is this uh, glycotoxic type, which got a combination between, you know, inflammation and, and um, atrophic support, um, lack of hormones, and uh, I'm trying to figure out how to word this, lack of hormones um, would be the atrophic type, the toxic type, the inflammatory type. Um, there are just all these different types and they're according to what's causing it. So once we know what's causing it, you know, we can start doing things about it. But people who have, um, let's say type two diabetes, they're a very high risk for Alzheimer's disease. And a lot of people that I see who have mild cognitive impairment don't have type two diabetes necessarily, but they do have insulin resistance. And again, this is still a contributor. Um, because once the brain becomes insulin resistant, then the brain starts to decline cognitively. And again, when we, we can use diet to improve that situation by 
providing the brain a different source of energy with ketones instead of glucose. And I do have people who have gotten markedly better, uh, primarily due to that. Uh, one of them, case in point, a couple of years ago, she called me. Um, same situation as the first one. She, she was concerned about her family history. Her mom has Alzheimer's and um, her grandmother had Alzheimer's. And she had just gotten a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment. And the doctor told her that there really wasn't anything else he could do except give her this medication and just have to wait and see. And she didn't want to wait and see. And um, so she started researching and she came across Dr. Bredesen's work. She came across me. And, um, you know, when we did her testing, we found what we find, which is very common in almost everyone, you know, the four main things, the insulin resistance, the inflammation, oxidative stress, nutrient deficiencies. And when we start working to fix all of that, um, I would say it took about three or four months and she was so much better. And today she even says, I, I sometimes even wonder if I had, if I had a problem. <laughs> wow. But, that's um, wonderful. Yeah. And interestingly, she'd also had um, arthritis in her hands and one of her hands in particular was really bad. And a doctor had told her she might need hand surgery one day. And that also went away. Wow. And all of that was because you took her through the testing and the, the program that you've been certified in and you've learned, right? Yes. That's, okay. So the testing shows all of that. Once you do the testing and that's blood work testing, right? Mm -hmm. Most of it. Then you can see what's happening, hopefully what's causing it and mm -hmm. move forward. It seems so simple compared to, I think what most people think out there, which is what you keep saying. They go to the doctor and the doctor tells them the exact same thing. Um, so are dementia and Alzheimer's related or what is the difference there? Um, dementia is kind of an umbrella term for neurodegenerative diseases. Um, Alzheimer's is a type of dementia. It's the most common type of dementia. I gotcha. So it's a type of dementia. Okay. And then when you keep saying, you know, giving, um, in terms of diet ketones instead of glucose, can mm -hmm. you explain that? Um, I guess just in a little bit in general for. Sure. Um, we use a diet that Dr. Bredesen calls the Ketoflex 12-3 diet. And basically that's a, it's a very healthy ketogenic diet that uses intermittent fasting and exercise as part of, you know, getting into mild ketosis and being able to maintain that. Um, it's a plant rich diet. It's, um, it's flexible in that it, it, you know, vegetarians could do it as well. Um, and we're trying to achieve something called metabolic flexibility because your body really should be going in and out of ketosis, you know, every 24 hours anyway, because the time that you sleep, you're fasting. And so we, we increase the fasting on either side of that so that you make sure your fast is like 12, 14 hours, maybe 16 hours for someone with a, um, genetic predisposition, but stop eating three hours before bedtime, wait until it's been 12 to 14 hours before you break that fast. And, you know, so eventually some people get into ketosis very easily. Some who already have insulin resistance have trouble with that. But, um, but by, you know, decreasing your sugars, decreasing your starchy fats, increasing your healthy fats, moderate amounts of clean protein, and lots of vegetables. Really, the vegetable recommendation on this diet is like six to nine cups of non-starchy vegetables a day, which is a lot. Wow. Um, and then, you know, you need your fiber and, and those kind of things. It's basically a very healthy, clean, um, ketogenic diet. Um, gotcha. And when, the, when, when you're in ketosis, then the brain can start to use those ketones for energy instead of glucose. And for people who have insulin resistance in the brain or brain hypometabolism, which is similar, just the brain can't use glucose very efficiently um, in hypometabolism. But um, when you give the brain the different energy source, it can use that and cognition will often improve when it wasn't able to use the glucose very efficiently. Uh, brain energy is what we're trying to improve here. And that's, that's just one of the major, major um, problems with people of Alzheimer's disease is it's a lack of brain energy, inflammation, often toxins. 
so interesting because all of what you're saying would help that. I can think of so many, so many other conditions, what you're just describing would help as well. Right. Yes. yes. Like just people with brain fog, people with insulin resistant people, the, I mean, even if you don't think you have this, your program sounds like a lot of people need it just for, I actually, for, for clarity, that. right. I, mean, I feel like I've been, I've been using this type of a, a lifestyle for, for many years. I mean, 20 years long before there was a, you know, recode protocol and, and all, but, um, but I really believe if you if you, if you take steps to prevent Alzheimer's, you're going to prevent just about everything else. Well, that's what I'm thinking. And all of these, you know, healthy tips are wonderful for, for everything. Cause I feel like this is what I preach just in general, but I, the fact that you could prevent that as well, but also the fact that you could take the blood work and find out really what is causing that. Like it makes, even if I don't think I have it, it makes me want the blood work just to know if there's <laughs> something going on that I'm, you know, that you're missing. Um, it's, it seems more helpful than your um, annual physical that you go to with your doctor or <laughs> like, and that's where I like your background because you look so much deeper and it's hard to find someone like you. And, and I like your specialty, but your knowledge really can help lots of things. And I'm, I'm guessing that's what you did before you specialized with Alzheimer's, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've done, done a lot of different things in my life, but um, uh, everything is always comes, comes back to the health for me. And um and it is true. I mean, if you take care of your body, your body, your body will work. But we we we're exposed to so much. I mean, you know, at first there's the educational aspect of people not even knowing anymore what's really healthy because right. there's so much marketing out there that's designed right. to confuse you so um, or mislead you. And yes. um, you know, I, the, one of the first things I tell people is let's just eat some real food. What's real food? Well, look at your plate. Can you grow it or hunt it? And right, if the right. answer to that question is no, then that's not real food. You know, and no. I mean, Dorito trees out there. Um, <laughs> and so, so no, let's we start don't. there. Let's get real food, you know, no, nothing with, you know, in a bag or a box with a big list of ingredients on it that you don't even recognize as food. Um, and these are something, things too, you know, that you can start teaching your children right now. I mean, my uh, stepson, he came into my life when he was 10 years old and um, I would always take him to the grocery store and he learned real fast a lot about reading labels and added sugars. And I, I asked him one day, I think it was 11 or 12. And I said, so how much sugar do you think would be... Um, appropriate how much should you should you be allowed how much sugar should you be allowed to eat like in teaspoons and mm -hmm. he said two I said okay now when we go to the grocery store I want you to do this math and I had him do the math to figure out you know well how much is a gram of sugar and and, and compared to a teaspoon right so it's like four grams in a teaspoon so we teach him that so now you can, you can have eight grams of sugar a day, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. and so we we're going to go for 10. And so anytime we were in the grocery store, he said, oh, can I get this? And I said, I don't know, check out the check out the sugars. And if it was more than 10 grams of sugar, he just automatically put it back. Oh, that's great. And made another choice. And, um, you know, and anytime I was looking at labels and things, I would just, I would have him look at the label and say, you know, will you look for this on this label? You know, would you look for this? And then he, he kind of learned to look for those things and that, no, we don't need those things and, and put those back. And of course I wasn't shopping a lot of aisles, you know, processed foods or anything, but even just looking for things that don't have MSG in them, if you're just looking for chicken broth or something like that, you know, right. he says, it's but it says just... no MSG on the front. And I said, I know, but they don't always tell the truth because MSG has a lot of names. Oh my goodness. So, so you can, you know, start teaching children very young to read the labels and look at these things and, and, you know, prevent their insulin resistance, which would then later lead to a number of health issues. It might not be Alzheimer's, it might be type two diabetes, it might be heart disease, it might be 
you know, any of those serious diseases that can easily start just by becoming insulin resistant. Right. Now, is there anything else, you know, we hear a lot about the gut and gut health and a lot of the diet and everything you described, obviously, is good for our gut. But is there anything else that we could do for for that? Because I'm, you know, they, they've, I've listened to so many things lately, the connection with the gut and the brain and the gut and the mind. Yeah. I mean, the gut and the brain are intimately connected. And there are a lot of different ways that what's going on in the gut can affect what's going on in the brain. And a lot of people have um, leaky gut, you know, te- intestinal permeability. And uh, what happens is that lining, the gut lining is very, very, very thin. And it can, it, it keeps, it's a barrier that keeps, um, keeps things out of the bloodstream that shouldn't be in there. And that can become permeable. And when that happens and things start to get into the bloodstream, uh, one of those things would be uh, lipopolysaccharide can get in the bloodstream and it actually can get through the blood brain barrier and, and get into the brain. And, you know, it could cause an infection there. There are a lot of ways that um, that can then create inflammation and then the inflammation can then make the brain produce amyloid. And, and that starts that whole cascade of problems. Um, so your, your gut health, the integrity of the gut barrier are very, very important. I tell you, and, and it goes back to what you said we should eat, (laughs) you know, if we're doing what we're supposed to. And I know with leaky gut though, that can be caused by something, right? Or it can be caused by several things. I mean, you know, gluten is very common, um, common cause of leaky gut for people who are especially sensitive, um, even without celiac disease. Um, glyphosate, the exposure to glyphosate can, can cause a leaky gut. And we're all exposed to that to some extent. You know, the question is not, you know, do I have some glyphosate in my body? It's how much. Um, and some of these, these things you can, you can test on your own. I mean, you can get a glyphosate test on your own and find out what that is. Um, you know, some of these other things I've, I've been talking about, you know, sugar and insulin and things you can, you can do your own glucose test and your own insulin test, and then calculate the, uh, insulin resistance. How many, it's a, it's called a HOMA IR score, which you can find online, uh, bloodcode.com and look for H O M A dash I R. And then you put your glucose number and your insulin number in that little calculator, and it'll tell you. Uh, what your insulin resistance score is. Interesting. Simple things, very simple things. You can get those tests on a life extension. But most doctors aren't doing these kinds of things. No, they test glucose regularly, but insulin, fasting insulin is not a standard test. Interesting. You can ask for it. Yes, there's a lot of things I feel like that aren't standard, but that's what I love when you find someone like you that does go deeper. And and if you, so going past the diet before, even if you were going to get tested and maybe you should get tested first before this, but are there other, um, so we have diet, we have sleep, we have exercise, anything else that is is good for someone that, that feels like I have it in my history. What else can I do? Like, you know, vitamins, are there certain vitamins or they should be taking, or is there anything else before the next step would be to get tested? Yeah. And one of the ways you can remember it is just with the acronym DRESS, D-R-E-S-S, diet, rest, sleep, exercise, stress reduction. Supplements can be very helpful as well. Um, I think the omega-3 supplements are extremely important. Um, B vitamins are very important. Magnesium, uh, D3 with K2, very important. I also use um, some herbs. I use ashwagandha. I use bacopa. Um, These are things that I'm just, you know, rattling off. Most of my clients use these. I use all of those that I just mentioned. Um, And then there are several more. Most of the time, I like to get the lab testing first, um, test don't guess, even before supplements, because, you know, where, where, where do you stand with that? What do you need? I will tell you, the exception, I think now of two people, all the people that I've ever tested, 
um, they were really low with their omega-3 fatty acids and their omega-6s are really high, um, which is an imbalance that's inflammatory. And it's very common, people eating just, you know, the regular standard American diet. Mm -hmm. um, it's very easy to reverse and, and, you know, improve that ratio. And it's very important for your brain health and your heart health and your overall health to do that. And that's another one of those things you could test yourself. Um, there's a test called the Omega Quant, um, just omegaquant.com. Get the Omega Plus test. And the report they provide is super easy to understand. Um, you want your omega-3 index to be at least 8%. Um, and then if it's not, they have some suggestions um, within that report about some things you can do. But of course, you want to increase your, your intake of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, most people do need a good supplement with that as well. And all of these that you keep saying you can test yourself, which is great. But when you test, it's Includes all of this that you yes. keep explaining. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah, I did and pretty extensive testing, and and it can depend on the individual too. I mean, someone who's already got symptoms. I mean, uh, one of my new clients. You know, we we've done extensive testing with her to figure out what exactly is causing her her cognitive problems, and we found a lot of of toxins, um, but we found some other things as well. So now you know now we have a path, but with someone who maybe doesn't have any symptoms and they're wanting to prevent, um, you know, we don't, we, we may still do all those same tests. We don't necessarily have to do them all at once. We're not, you know, it's not as urgent that we get things done quickly, but, um, you know, it kind of depends on the person as how far they want to go with it. Right. Um, and so you, you mentioned, um, Cognitive testing, is that that's something you do as well, like the blood work and cognitive testing? Yeah, a lot of my clients come to me and they've already had cognitive testing. Um, if they already have a diagnosis, they've got a MOCO or they've got a neuropsychological report. The tests that I usually do, I um, can do a SLUMS test, which is very similar to the MOCA test. Um, and then there's an online cognitive assessment that I have people do. Um, it's called CRYO, C-R-E-Y-O-S. And, um, and then sometimes the, one of the programs that we use for cognitive um, improvement, cognitive training is called Brain HQ. And after you use that program for two, three weeks, you'll get some really good data there as well. Very interesting. Um, so I'm wondering like all of this to me now, as you talk all the prevention and everything. So is there ever a point um, age wise, it, I mean, is there, I guess, is there always possibilities of reversal or improving no matter how old, I guess, is my question. Yeah. It's not the age so much as, as what's causing it and how long it's been going on. You gotcha. know, you know, typically you would think the older you are, the longer it's been going on, which would make sense. Um, because, you know, like I said, it starts before you have symptoms. But, um, but there's a, I'm trying to think, the, the, one of the books that Dr. Bredesen wrote, the most recent one, it's called The First Survivors of Alzheimer's. And in that book, there are the stories, I believe, of seven of his patients um, who were in his original study. I think most of them were in the original 2014 study who had Alzheimer's disease, diagnosed Alzheimer's disease, and they all reversed it, and they're all still doing well. Wow. And those seven chapters are written by each one of those people. They wrote their own chapter. Oh, that's... And so tell me um, the name of that. Say that again. It's called The First Survivors of Alzheimer's. The First it's by Survivors. by Dr. Dale Bredesen. And then the second half of that book, he's got a really nice Q&A section. Um and some additional information. Very readable. His first book, um, excellent, excellent book. Um, a lot of people had a lot of trouble really understanding it. He went into a lot of detail, um, you know, about the causes of Alzheimer's, and a lot of it gets really technical. It's an excellent book, but a lot of people have trouble understanding it. This book is, um, it's great because First of all, it's it's not so technical. So that whole Q&A part, much easier to understand. And then, of course, you start off with all these great success stories. 
which I love. And I just feel that it's, it's like a breath of fresh air because it's not what you hear in right. the mainstream. Right. And so, and not everyone, you know, necessarily, I feel like we've been, um, I don't know, trained to just go to a doctor, hear what they say, do what they say. And even when I talk to clients, sometimes it's hard to get them to think outside the box because they think, well, I can't do that. He's telling me to do this. But all of what you're saying is, it's just, it has like research that shows it. And you're, you're saying that you're seeing these changes. So. Well, you know, there are a couple I of just, points. First of all, we've been trained to wait for symptoms and then go to a doctor. And if you wait for symptoms with Alzheimer's disease, you could very possibly get to the point you can't get better. Gotcha. And so and for them to even say wait. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, at mild cognitive impairment, I mean, really, if you look at the actual stages of Alzheimer's, the first stage is pre-symptomatic, no symptoms. Okay, the second stage is subjective cognitive impairment. You're starting to notice some little things. And like I said, most people will attribute these things to just aging, you know. Yes. But not always. My, my client I told you about a minute ago, I mean, he all of a sudden was having trouble with reading comprehension, which is very odd. You know, so pay attention to those things and don't assume it's just normal aging. Um, I like to say it's probably not that normal. It's common and you don't have to live with that either. But right. um, but so you've got the pre-symptomatic and then you've got this subjective cognitive impairment. You just are noticing things are different and things will show up on your test results. Um, and then you get this mild cognitive impairment. Now you've got a diagnosis and there's actually nothing mild about this because things have been going wrong for a couple of decades at this point. And the next step is an Alzheimer's diagnosis. And so if you're at that mild cognitive impairment stage, you, you must be taking actions right now. Do not wait to get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's because all you're doing is, is letting things get worse and worse when there's so many things you could do to figure out what's causing it and then try to stop it and then try to reverse it. Wow. And even, so you, you mentioned toxins before. Um, so what would be some ways you think you could look in your environment now or your life and reduce toxins without even being, you know, just if you wanted to, to improve that without even getting tested? That's a really good question. Um, because, because we are all exposed to so much every day. I mean, certainly you can, you can take a look at the types of products that you're using in your home, your cosmetics, your personal care products, your cleaning products, and, and use things that are as natural as possible. You could, you could go to the, um, environmentalworkinggroup.org, ewg.org, and you can find, um, alternatives to everything on that website. Interesting. Um, they've yeah. done the research for you. And so if you want to find, you know, the best cosmetics that are low toxins, or if you want to find the best cleaning products or whatever, that's, that's a definitely a, a good way to start. Um, you can also pay attention to the air quality in your home. Um, in Florida, where I live, we have, um, a lot of humidity, a lot of tropical kind of weather. And, and, and so we've all got a little bit of mycotoxins floating around in our house. The question again, here's how much, and, um, and you can do some very simple testing to find out. You can use these mold plates from a company called CitraSafe. They're $3 each. You can put them out in every room for an hour, then you stick them in a drawer for three or four days. And then when you look at them, anything, any one of those rooms that had more than like four mold spores in it, that could be a problem. And then you can, you know, you know, you need to go a little further with your investigation at that point, but that's one way you could maybe detect it. That would be easy and inexpensive. Um, say that, say, sit, did you say citrus safe? Yeah. Yeah. Citrus, citrus safe. safe. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a, that's a great tip right there. Yeah. Very, very easy. And, you know, um, and then for, you know, if you do have, have a problem, you know, a HEPA filter using a, a air purifier can be, can be helpful. Um, but if you, if you have a serious problem with, with mold in your house, you, you're, you're going to have to get a professional to address that. And, and it's, it's, 
it's a hard world to navigate on your own. Um, you do want to look for um, companies that understand the health implications. When I work with people on this, of course, I'm, I'm working with people who are already having cognitive decline usually because of it. And um, so we want to we want to find companies that can that understand that. Um, and there are some out there now. So you have found some that you feel are better at There's knowing. There's one called what um, uh, the website. Uh, was, yes, we inspect. And go into that website, you'll see that I think the right on the front page they're talking about the various types of health issues, cognitive even. Um, okay. that happen because when I, when I find people who have exposure to mycotoxins and that's causing their cognitive decline, they don't usually have other symptoms that are typical of mold exposure. It's usually just the cognitive decline that we see. And you were saying if, I think you said if it was over four, you should obviously see a company over four of the mold spores, yeah, I believe of that's the mold, what it mold is. spores, and then under that, if you showed somebody it was under a HEPA filter, would be something that would help. Yeah, oh, HEPA, no. HEPA, yeah, HEPA filters are good for helping to clean the air. And I feel like that test is so good because I always I was I was reading about HEPA filters and our air and um, you know how to know like I can I know how to test my water but I was like well so what's my next step of testing the air so it's so interesting you said that and mold is probably the biggest thing are there other things in our air that we should be concerned with in our homes um I, I think mold is probably the biggest issue I, I haven't seen as far as the cognitive problems go I haven't seen people have um, other problems within their homes so much, you know, we do want them to reduce their toxic exposures. So like I said earlier with the, with the other types of products, right. um, fragrances and things like that, because they can be very toxic. So toxic. And that's the other thing I've read, been reading over the last few years. And just as I tell my clients, I'm like, it's, it's so overwhelming. Just take one thing at a time, mm -hmm. <laughs> little by little, just try to reduce your exposure because cleaning out the whole thing is, I think a lot, <laughs> but it there is. really is. It um, is, but there's so much you can do. And it's so, um, some things, they're just easy swaps, you know, buy this instead of that. Yes. Easy swaps. I would absolutely agree. And the more I do, the better I feel. And I feel like now when I, um, do smell like fake scents or they're very overwhelming to me <laughs> Yeah, because I, I try to reduce them. And now when someone has them, I have to almost like get to fresh air. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that is so strong and sap and just smells terrible. Um, so I do want, before we wrap it up, um, I want to, so we've talked a lot about what you do, but I'd like for you to give, um, obviously you do one-on-one -on -one with what you've kind of told us so far. You have a group program as well. Is that correct? I do. I have, um, I have a membership. It's called Direct Access because it does give you direct access to me. It gives you direct access to my clients. So I, I, I developed this because I wanted to put my clients in touch with each other um, for that support and because it allows me to support more than one person at a time. I can't work one-on-one -on -one with that many people. Um, so we have that support there. It includes lots of education that's embedded in, in that membership as well. Lots of video education on all the different diet, rest, exercise, stress reduction, supplements, gut health, toxins. Um, and then we do quarterly Zoom calls and things like that. So that's, that's the, um, that's, I think, one of the best things people can do because you get, you get access to everything. It's 75 a month. And, um, and you learn a lot being involved in that. And then right. I do a, a group coaching about three times a year. I have a new one, another one, one's going on now, but another one's coming up in January. That's a 12 week program. And um, sometimes people just join that group coaching program. And that also includes the 12 weeks of membership to the direct access group. And so a lot of the things that we're covering in that group coaching program, then some of the homework is going to be 
um, tied to some of the resources that are in the direct access community. But that coaching program is action oriented. And so for 12 weeks, it's, it, you're taking action and you have that weekly group support um, where you can ask questions or troubleshoot or whatever it is you need to do. And, um, and then my one-on-one services include both of those things, the direct access community, as well as that uh, 12 weeks of, I call it quick start coaching. And, um, and then all the lab testing and um, support that you need for that. Those are great resources and, and three good options of how you can go get access to you. And what's your website that they can find all this? Um, ageonpurpose.com. Okay. And the one thing we didn't talk about, we talked about all these good things and the testing and the, um, are, are there, are there mind, um, training or anything like that exercises that you do that yeah. help this as well? Because I know uh -huh. I've always done these things and doing, you know, they say buy them, you know, crossword puzzles, puzzles, like keep the mind working, but in your early stages, I guess. Yeah, the crossword puzzles aren't really that effective. It's not that they're bad or anything, right. but you can do a lot better. Um, I, I mentioned earlier the Brain HQ. That's one of the best things you can do, memory, attention, processing. Um, it improves all of those things. Uh, I've spent about 14 years, I'll say I invested about 12 years, I think, working for a neuroscience company and the principal neuroscientist um, who who developed this Brain HQ program Brain HQ program I worked for in another company, and it's pretty phenomenal, um, the things that, the improvements that you can see just with that program. And then other things that you can do, learn something new every single mm -hmm. year. Pick something brand new to learn, not something that you already know that you're just building on that knowledge, but something brand new. Um, learn to play an instrument. Uh, one of the things that I think... Um, caused my mom's Alzheimer's to happen later than the other women in our family was the fact that she learned to play golf. Uh, oh, I love she, that. When she was about 50 years old, she learned to play golf. And that was a brand new skill for her. She hadn't been athletic. I mean, you know, she walked and did that kind of stuff, but never really participated in any sports. And so golf was a great thing for her to learn. You know, I mean, you've got a lot of skills going on there and a lot of cognitive things going on there as well. So um, learn something new, brand new every year. And not only will that in, you know, improve your quality of life overall and keep you interested, um, but it's great for the brain because the brain loves novelty. The brain is amazing. I feel like the more you learn about the brain and the things that you can do, I, I love all of what you gave us today because everything is is. I mean, I say simple, it's not always easy, but they're simple, like life shifts and changes that you can do to be healthier. And not only like you just said, it enhances your life, but you're also helping to prevent disease. So there's just so many benefits to all of the, the things that we go back to. I feel like it always comes back to what we eat, how we sleep, moving our body um, and reducing stress. So you, you did yes. touch on that a little bit. Um, before we wrap this up, do you have some suggestions? Cause a lot of people laugh at me when I say reduce your stress. I'm like, no, there, there, there are possible ways to reduce stress. You are 100% in control of that. Absolutely. Um, stress reduction, in my opinion, is probably the most important and yet overlooked mm -hmm. way to prevent disease, Alzheimer's disease included. I think it all starts there. Yes. Because when you look at what happens as a result of chronic stress in your body over a number of years, um, you can't live in a state of chronic stress for years without inviting disease. And it really kind of just depends on the person's genetics and things like that as to which disease it's going to be. Right. But it's coming. And so you must get in control of that. And you can, because you have to remember stress is a first and foremost, it's a perception. Mm -hmm. And so while you may not be able to control all the things going on around you, some of it you can, but maybe not all of it, 
you can control what's going on inside of you. And so a lot of stress reduction practices, they don't take that long, but they're really effective. And one of them that's, that's been proven to be effective for people who have cognitive decline, it's a, it's a meditation. It's called, if I'm saying it right, it's called Kirtan Kriya meditation. It's 12 minutes. If you would bookend your day with this 12 minute meditation, and it's an active meditation. Some people say, oh, I can't do medication, meditation. I can't stop my thoughts. I'm like, well, welcome to the club. Neither can anybody else. <laughs> um, you know, you don't have to stop your thoughts. But the nice thing about this particular meditation is it's an active kind of a meditation so that you're actually doing something for these 12 minutes and it's not thinking about all the things you have to do. <laughs> um, but bookending your day with that, it can start your day off and, and a really nice pace and then you can end your day in a way that will help you go to sleep um and really make what a is big it difference. called again can you Kiritin say that kriya kiratin kriya yeah okay. i'm saying it right k-r-i-t-a-n um gotcha. but there's a lot of good research that. on that there's a lot of good research in general um on the, the brain benefits of meditation but it actually benefits the whole body. And when you bring your stress down and you learn how to control that and manage that and not stay in that state all the time, um, you know, you definitely are preventing disease and, and improving your quality of life. And even if you've been in it for a long time, you can start right now. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? Like, and that's the thing. I think sometimes we feel like we're on this like path of this is what we've always done. This is no, like I hear a lot of, well, this is me. This is who I am. This is, and I'm like, yeah, but you can change that. And it's exactly what you just said. I love that you said like, you know, we get to control it. It's our perception and it really Absolutely. is. Absolutely. Yeah. And Don't you identify yourself it. with your problems. Exactly. Very good. So you've given us such good information today, Angela. I really, I so appreciate your time. And I feel like if anything, people probably just want to learn more, but you gave us so much to start with. Um, so thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate the time. And is there any, any other place they can find you or anything else you feel like they should know before we close this up? Um, I do have a free Facebook group. Oh, okay. That's great. Yeah. The question what's is, that called? how do you find it? It's a, it's, it's a, is long... it H on purpose too? Um, no, it's not actually, I think I started this free Facebook group even before that. Um, Alzheimer's prevention and Bredesen recode support. Great. And I will, I will get that from you and I'll put it in the show notes. I'll put your, your, um, website, you know, how they can, so they can find you and I'll put the Facebook group too, so they can find you. Um, cause that's great information. I feel like sometimes it's so overwhelming or, or like we said, you're not feeling anything yet, but just shifting how you're living your life makes changes. And then maybe, you know, there is a, a point where you want to take a step further and learn more. Um, because it's a lot of this is becoming so common and, um, when it, you can actually make choices to change it. Yeah, it's, it's becoming so common. And like I said, the most important thing you can do is start doing something right now. Don't wait for symptoms, cognitive or otherwise. Um, you know, start taking action right now. Don't try to be perfect. Just make progress. Exactly. I love that. And I, I always just start with what's easy. Like we told you a lot. And if you're not doing any of this, pick which one of those things seems the easiest. I appreciate you sharing this time with me today. I am grateful you are here. And if you have anyone that you feel could also benefit from this encouragement, please share it with them today. You can also add a quick review on iTunes, which would mean the world to me and help me just to make this better for each and every one of you out there. I will be here each week. So please be sure to subscribe to the podcast or join me at kellyrenato.com to get the latest episode and more tools to help you on your journey to feel your best and enjoy every single day exactly where you are. I would love to have you join my journey and let's all add good, healthy vibes anywhere we can every single day. Enjoy your week. 
and embrace the season you're in. And I look forward to next week. Take care. Bye-bye.